from uh, here from Wall Street. Uh, I say that tongue in cheek, but it's actually uh, quite true. Uh, Brian, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, Brian Modoff uh, kick off uh, uh, our, our event to last at least three years. And um, it always uh, uh, is one of my favorite parts of the day because it, it sets perspective, it sets tone on, on what's happening uh, across the industry, where, where the, uh, the money, if you will, is, is focusing and, and what problems uh, the large corporations that, that are in the space uh, are, are facing. And uh, I think it always is, is a good way to sort of start the capstone of, of the conversation. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Modoff. He's a managing director at the Deutsche Bank. He's been uh, covering the uh, wireless, cellular, whatever this word has become over the years, uh, since 1993 uh, for, uh, uh, in, in the space and, and knows a, a ton about this. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Modoff. So, uh, so yeah, I have been speaking for uh, three years at this conference, and I know some of you might be saying, so what do we do? You know, so briefly, what do we do? We write, write research. We study the industry. We go to trade events like this one. We go to things like Mobile World Congress. We meet with companies. We get involved with startups. Uh, I've been, in 20 years, we've seen a number of companies go from uh, just a, a couple guys in, a, in an office to a big company. Uh, and uh, we get to know them early. Uh, we try to understand what they're doing. Uh, we try to connect them uh, because we know a lot of people in the industry and they might be doing something that we find fascinating that one of our companies would find interesting as well. Uh, and then eventually we take them public. It's interesting, one of your sponsors up there was Comscope. We just launched this week, ironically, a $750 million IPO for that company. We're in the middle of doing that. So if you see me out on the phone some, somewhere here, I'm talking to one of our clients about getting involved in that deal. Um, so that's what we do, just so, so you know. And my associate BJ is actually here too. He's writing a report on big data analytics. He'll be on one of the panels uh, later this morning talking about what he sees in those trends. Uh, so that should be interesting. So a year ago we were up here, we talked about, I, I told you we'd written a, a report about uh, four and a half G or uh, LT, LT and beyond. And essentially, uh, since then, a year uh, back in May, we wrote a second report from, and the, the title of that one was From Start to LTE and Beyond. The title of this one is From Start to Mobile Clouds and Beyond. And we talk about is where are we going with, uh, with these uh, networks? How are they evolving? What's, what's 5G going to look like? Uh, one of the key assertions we made a year ago, and we're going to elaborate a little bit more on it, is the fact that, and, and I'll, I'll actually correct it a little bit when I say it to this year, but one of the things we highlighted was that the air interface, in terms of its efficiency for Shannon's limits, was getting pretty close. We were, in terms of bits per hertz, we could get to the cell edge, which is always the limiter. We were getting pretty efficient in terms of how many bits per hertz we can get to the cell edge dealing with noise. Uh, after that, I did meet an interesting company called Kumu, K-U-M-U, -U, which is trying to do full duplex wireless. Essentially, yeah, they're trying to transmit and receive in the same channel simultaneously, not TDD, but full on, you know, transmit and receive, full duplex. Wireless. We're actually going to have them on a conference call with investors uh, about the third week of November to talk about what they're doing. Some uh, Stanford PhDs, uh, they've already got funding by Qualcomm and Cisco, so that'll be interesting to see whether they can take, whether what they show us in the lab, which as you all know if you're engineering students, is one thing and what you see in the real world is another. So anyway, so, um, so where are we? Um, well, you can see that they're good, according to Cisco, there's going to be 19 billion connected devices and 3.6 billion internet users by 2017. Qualcomm, I'd actually tell you that by 2018, we're gonna go from six billion uh, connected devices now to over 25 billion. So we're really, we're moving well beyond the individual and their one or two devices to a number of items. Um, the, the one thing we noted uh, um, last year at CES, last January, was there was a whole section at, at CES of medical health, uh, you know, all kinds of sensor type devices. We think this year that's going to be uh, go from a section of CES to a whole floor. We think you're going to see an explosion in the number of ideas out there for people putting uh, things out that are connected to your body to check for your health, uh, to check for, you know, for exercise, for all these things. So it's, we're going to start with, you know, we're already seeing it with a watch, we're going to start with humans, but we're going to go way beyond that. If you, if you remember last year, um, the Cisco speaker, um, 
uh, spoke a lot about what they're calling the Internet of Everything. So we've heard this term before in the past, but the idea that when you, you look at what he was talking about, where your car is connected, there are sensors in the roads, wireless networks all over the place. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about small cells. I think the thing that gives you a perspective on is that we're very much still in our infancy in terms of where we're headed in all of this. We, we're connected, but there's a lot more things to be connected and a lot more things on our, on our bodies to be connected. Um, so how do we, you know, so we've got this, we're going to have a lot of things connected, a lot of traffic generated. Some of it's going to be machine to machine, so it, you know, it's, it's not going to have, have to be that much bandwidth intensive, but there'll be a lot more uh, bandwidth intensity uh, as we grow. How are we going to get there? If you look at what, what LTEB is, it, it, it builds on LTEA, uh, which is LTE Advanced. Um, but the, the one thing that we're, we're going to show you here is that in addition to the network itself uh, driving more capacity is how do we make these networks more usable? So what we're showing you here is, is essentially, um, you know, we talk about SANS, which is self-organized networks. Again, what SANS is about is, is interference mitigation. Uh, Hotspot 2.0. Hotspot 2.0 is about trying to make Wi-Fi more manageable and try to integrate it more with wireless. So you, you can actually, the idea, uh, as in talking to one of the engineers at Bell Labs, is, the, is that you, you have a very flexible radio architecture. So you assign bandwidth to users based on who they are, what radios they can see, uh, what everyone else is around them is doing, and what they want to do. So, you have a variety of radio frequencies, and some are more, uh, you know, usable for certain things, and some for others. Like white space is an example. It's kind of noisy. You wouldn't use white space uh, frequencies for something like a, a, a call or a video, but you could very well use that frequency for a data transfer because that eventually, as long as the file gets there eventually, that's what you're trying to do. So the idea here is to have, a, you know, to have a very intelligent assignment of uh, bandwidth based on. What, what's, what is attempt being attempted. Um, this is another area that we talked about in this new report. And by the way, for any of you that would like that, just shoot me an email, brian.modoff at db.com. We'll send you this report, because it's uh, we really talk about not only the bandwidth we're enabling, but then what do we do with it? How does, the, how does the carrier bring new services to the market? And if you think about what is SDN, what is NFB, the idea here is really trying to simplify the delivery of new services to the network. Those of you that have been around carriers for a while know that you know, when, when they want to bring a new service out, it's a process. It takes months, if not years. It can take millions of dollars. Um, they put a lot of effort into them, and they, they study them a lot because if they fail, it's expensive. What we're trying to do with SDN and NFE, and NFE is really a carrier-driven standard, is to simplify that whole process and really to kind of mimic in a way what we're seeing on the internet side of the world. The ability to bring the new service to the market, you know, bring it very regionally, bring it with low cost. Uh, if, there's a, if it fails, uh, it doesn't really cost a lot, but the idea is you're shortening it down from months and years to, to weeks. You're taking costs from millions of dollars to deploy a new service down to you know, thousands of dollars. Uh, and you're essentially allowing experimentation on their network, which as you know, carriers are very particular about their network. They don't, they're very sensitive to security, to QoS, all those things. This is a way for them to allow new services to come on, to allow orchestration and service chain, to allow people to actually be able to, to uh, on the fly, select new services and not impact the network. So, you know, so uh, in this, this one right here, we talk about mobile data services on the fly. So essentially the service orchestration to allow you to bring new services uh, onto the market. Um, these are some of the companies we talk about in terms of how, how, who benefits from this. I know Juniper is one of the sponsors, and they're, they have a little work to do in this area. But we think Cisco, uh, as Flavio said, noted last year, they, have, they understand that Cisco is very focused on building architectures these days. That's where we're headed. We're very much in networking move from selling boxes to building architectures. And F5, they work at the Intel, they work in layers four through seven, the intelligence layer. They really help you manage data across or uh, mobile data across a wide area of mobile network. Um, one of the other things we talked about in this report was really densification, because it was, as we noted earlier, when you're looking at bits per hertz, you know you're, you're trying to get as high a bits per hertz as close to the cell edge as possible to maximize system capacity. 
thing small cells do is they bring those cell edges in closer together. So your, your chances of, uh, when you shrink the cells, your chances of having a higher fit rate close to the cell edge goes up. We do see significant growth in small cells over the next several years. There's a private company we cover, uh, called SpiderCloud. Uh, they have won some major contracts, uh, like with Vodafone. Uh, we're starting to see this, this technology take off now. So we think this year, and in particular in the next year, you're really going to see a jump up in network densification. That brings its own, own set, set of challenges, but you know, we're going to densify. We're, you know, as when you look back at what Cisco said on this Internet of Everything and sensors in cars and, and uh, hotspots and wireless networks at street corners, this is part of that process. It, when you think about where we are right now and where we're going, we still have a long way to go in terms of the build out of the network. So I'll stop there and uh, any questions? Yes. Is the spectrum community, the spectrum regulation, keeping up with that? Did this move, or is it going to be a hindrance in the next five to ten years? It's been a hindrance. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, like with uh, uh, with uh, uh, any of you remember uh, uh, FirstNet? This is the idea of trying to bring LTE. Think about it, LTE to our first responders. One of the ways that they're looking at uh, trying to get participation in that spectrum auction is to allow, like a Verizon, to use that spectrum for commercial purposes, but then whenever, because we're talking about 20 megahertz, we're talking about a chunk of spectrum, uh, uh, whenever first responders need it to get the priority. So they're, they're starting to actually think about commercial ways of opening up existing spectrum that they need that we can use, we use most of the time, and they can use it when they, when they need it. The other thing that you, you think about in terms of spectrum is that we, you know, we first started out with 800 megahertz, and then we thought, oh, we're gonna push the envelope and go to 1900 megahertz, and now we're doing 2500 megahertz. When you densify, when you put your cell, cells closer together, you can start to make even higher frequencies mobile. So one of the things that's going to solve it is the fact that as we densify these networks, we're going to go to 3.5. I know that uh, the guys here at UT are even working on 60 gigs. And you think, why 60 gigs? Well, the idea is, the, as you all know, the higher the frequency, the shorter the sine wave. The shorter the sine wave, the smaller the antenna. You get to 60 gigahertz, you're dealing with a very small frequency, but you can then start doing multi-array antennas. You can have lots of them, and then you can do signal aggregation to try to get the signal and pull it in. So densification leads to the ability to use higher frequencies. So in some ways, while they are getting more nimble in the lower frequencies, we're also getting better at exploiting higher frequencies. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? So you didn't mention CRAM in your talk. Is that? Is that I didn't mention like what? CRAM, cloud RAM. You mentioned cloud and then mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on cloud? Yeah, I mean, you know, the CRAN or, or cloud, essentially, one of the things that, if you, if you recall, those of you who have been in wireless for a long time, you know, the way we used to, uh, to propagate our signals is we put a base station here, you know, down here, then we'd run up an antenna like this, and it'd go up copper, and we'd lose about, you know, 2, 3 dB of signal strength just trying to push it up the copper out to the antennas. Um, we're moving increasingly to, to essentially to fiber, or essentially base station hotels, where we run fiber up to the antenna, it's baseband in there, then we actually amplify the signal at the top and send it out. We get, you, know, you get much smaller uh, footprints, you get a lot more efficiency out of it, but we, we started doing this because we're trying to deal with this loss. We're now taking that concept, and if you think about small cells and even distributed antenna systems, where you're moving increasingly, if you, if, so if I have fiber, I can put that base station, I don't need necessarily put that base station at the bottom of the building. <coughs> I can put it in one location, run fibers from that location out to several or multiple cell sites, and then manage my uh, spectrum that way. So we do see kind of more of an evolution towards that cloud RAN architecture. Yes? What's your opinion on the impact that um, the spectrum sharing, white space, et cetera? Uh, you know, I think this word, the, the network intelligence gets increasingly higher. We have the ability to use spectrum like that. So we do see that 
Now we'll see how the government treats that. You know how they uh, what, what they allow us to do, but we'll solve the problem of being able to access and use that spectrum. It's just a matter of whether the regulators let us. But you know we will certainly make sure that interference isn't uh, you know an issue. In that. Regarding specification models and deployment models, have you had discussions around supporting models for that, i.e. distributed antenna systems and or what are people looking at? Uh, in terms of um, in terms of how you deploy these micro pico antenna cells. They used to, they talked about doing them in the homes for a while. Right? Yeah. And yeah. it didn't really apply to this what? Point. And now we're talking about distributed antenna systems, et cetera, but the actual necessary sort of deployment models I'm just curious if you've heard this. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's still, like, with the only challenge with femtos in an enterprise is what about a multi-mode, multi-band femto? I mean, how expensive is that going to be if you're going to support more than one carrier? Like what we see with uh, SpiderCloud is Google and Vodafone. Vodafone is populating these buildings, but it's only for people who have Vodafone phones. So, you know, there is, the, there is that challenge where DAS tends to be agnostic. The only thing with DAS is that, um, you know, how do you how do you deploy the DAS system? Because one of the things I've seen with many DAS systems is really they're just borrowing spectrum from the macro cell. And if you're borrowing from the macro, you can whip traffic off, but you're not necessarily densifying in the sense of you know adding more channels and adding more capacity. So we're not we're still figuring that part out because that that is the one thing about Femtos. Backhaul we think we saw because backhaul is that you said even in the home you've got a broadband connection that that's enough. But it's how you deploy for, for uh, a number of carriers simultaneously is still the challenge in that model. These, these numbers you have are currently one small cell per macro in 2027 per the sign. It seems extraordinarily conservative, uh, like off by 10x to me, um, uh, versus I think what it was. This is revenue. Oh, revenue? Yeah. Oh, but yeah. you're saying there are less than one femto pico per macro by 2020, there's only seven small cells per macro. I don't think that's right. Yeah, you think that's even yeah. too small? Waste too small. Uh, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll see. You know, the one thing we tend to do is, and I've been doing this for 20 years, I know my time's up. Um, one thing we tend to do is underestimate how long it's going to take us to actually get where we think we're going to go. We do that constantly. You know, it's like we, and, and we've got this old saying, it's like, okay, best thing since, uh, since sliced bread isn't going to work, gets deployed. And, and it's just, there's a time issue here. I mean, you, you just think about, we still have, how are we going to, you know, the, the, the amount of equipment, the amount of fiber being laid to do these things, it's just a lot of work. Yeah, but I think like you said, the femtos can happen very organic. I think there already is more than one femto per macro in most markets. I mean, it's all, I don't know if these are worldwide numbers, but I mean, certainly in uh, Japan, it's already, that's way, way higher than that yeah. already. I mean, it's more than seven already. Uh, so I don't know, it's, I, I'm just curious what No, I mean, I, we, we would frankly like that number to be a lot higher because it's good for us. I'm wondering, what, what's front of mind for these operators? Is, is it the lack of capacity, or is it the throughput speed, or as you, as you start overlaying all these systems, is the interference that's going to be generated, or is it the hard cost of delivery? I mean, what, what keeps those guys awake at night? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's all of it. I mean, that's, those are all issues they're dealing with constantly. You know, I would say backhaul is clearly going to be one of their, because if you're going to densify, you put a lot of things <laughs> in, 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 in buildings. And in homes, you're right, that back all issue solved. But uh, I think for the other parts, how do we do this? And there are like a private companies trying to fix it with microwaves. You got other companies trying to do it with, you know, how do we, how would we lower the cost of fiber? I mean, that's going to be, I think, back all probably is you're asking what is the one biggest item that keeps them awake is because it's not easy, it's easy to solve. Yeah. So, thank you, Brian, for your broad and kickoff perspective. Uh, as you've seen, Brian has a very detailed report, which I think will be of great interest to uh, many of you. So I'd like to invite my colleague, Alex DeMarcus, to in invite our, introduce our keynote speaker, Tassos, uh, for this morning. Thank you. This goes around. Okay. Okay. So, you know, when I introduce uh, 